Hi everybody. Um, so the lecture on abortions is going to start in a moment. I just wanted to add this little snippet at the beginning. Um, this lecture is going to try covering all of the sort of core arguments on abortion that uh, are important in, in, at an intro level of philosophy. Um, I'm not aiming to convince you either way. Uh, I'm adding this little note here because it's a good couple minutes, maybe 30 or 40, until I start to get to the arguments against abortion. So I just wanted to make it clear that uh, even though we spend a good amount of time early on in this lecture explaining why a couple arguments against abortion fail and maybe illustrating an argument in favor of abortion, we'll eventually get to several, at least two, fairly powerful arguments um, for the pro-life side. Uh, by the end, I think you'll have realized that we've discussed in a very charitable way uh, arguments that are both pro-choice and pro-life. So uh, this lecture, I think, if I've done this successfully, uh, should be a fairly balanced view of uh, the arguments on both sides about the permiss moral permissibility or impermissibility of abortion. So enjoy. Hi, uh, my name is Andrew Fife. I work at the University of Maryland, and uh, I'm going to give you a lecture today about abortion and cover basically all the sorts of things that you might want to cover in an intro to philosophy or intro to contemporary moral problems class on abortion. So um, first, <clears throat> let's just talk about the distinction between legal and moral questions, right? So we're not interested here in legal questions. Whether abortion should be banned or permitted legally is a further question. The first thing that we need to settle is if murder in the first, if, it, if abortion is murder in the first place. And that's the question we aim to settle here, right? Is it a moral thing to do to have an abortion? Is it morally permissible? And you can think about this as a question of, if it was legal, do you think you should still have one if your circumstances led you to be inclined to? So um, the first thing to mention, although I'm not going to talk much about it, right, because this is not a religion class or a religion lecture but if we think about like Western religions and its relationship to abortions and if you look at the Christian Jewish Bible um, <clears throat> you know there's plenty of passages that sort of reveal God's attitude towards human life and especially the ontological status of unborn children and their pregnant mothers-to-be so I did not produce these brief summaries of different passages but here's a passage from Exodus which seems to say things like a pregnant woman who is injured and aborts the fetus warrants financial compensation only to her husband, and that sort of suggests that the fetus is property and not a person. There's lots of passages. I'm not going to go through all of these, right? The point being that the biblical um, attitude towards the unborn fetus is not does not seem to be uh, as if the fetus is a person. Uh, although... Uh, the Bible is not the only authority on the Christian uh, approach to abortion, particularly if you're a Catholic, right? We've got the Pope, God's representative <clears throat> on earth. And we're going to start with his argument because it's a nice, um, a nice place to start in any sort of discussion of abortion because he provides the sort of simplistic argument against abortion. So I'm going to read from an encyclical that he wrote, I think in the 90s. Um, <clears throat> where he's arguing against abortion. Um, just to point out, uh, popes, according to the Christian faith, can speak infallibly according to that religion. Like in, It's impossible for them to be wrong. Although, for them to have that status, or whatever they're saying to have that status, the popes have to say, I'm now speaking infallibly. Uh, notably, the pope is not doing that when he... Uh, makes this pronouncement about abortion he makes an argument against it uh, and we're going to judge the argument on its merits right so he's admitting that he could be wrong because he's not claiming to be speaking infallibly so just to read from the encyclical <clears throat> but no word has the power to change the reality of things procured abortion is the deliberate and direct killing by whatever means it is carried out of a human being in the initial phase of his or her existence extending from the from conception to birth some people try to justify abortion by claiming that the result of conception 
at least up to a certain number of days, cannot be considered a personal human life. But in fact, from the time that the ovum is fertilized, a life has begun, which is neither that of the father nor the mother, it is rather the life of a new human being with his own growth. It would never be made human if it were not human already. This has always been clear, and modern genetic science, notice that he's appealing to science here and not religious rev revelation from God, offers clear confirmation. It has demonstrated from the first instant there is established the program of what this living being will be, a person, this individual person with his characteristic aspects already well determined, right from fertilization, the adventure of human life begins, and each of its capacities require time, a rather lengthy time, to find its place and to be in a position to act, even if the presence of a spiritual soul cannot be ascertained by empirical data, this, the results themselves of scientific research on the human embryo provide a valuable indication for discerning by the use of reason a personal presence at the moment of the very first appearance of a human life. How could a human individual not be a human person? Great. Now he's made an appeal here to human reason, so let's use reason to evaluate this argument. So he's giving us the basic argument against abortion, right? And the first premise is something like this. It is wrong to kill an innocent human being. So let's focus on why he focuses on innocent human beings. Obviously, you might think it's okay to kill a mugger in self-defense. You might assume that it's okay to kill enemy soldiers at times of war. Um, he's generally saying it's wrong to kill a human being except for those sort of complicated special cases that abortion is not one of them. In philosophy, we have a couple different phrases, although you might see these in both science literature and legal literature, prima facie, pro tanto, ceteris paribus. And th these just mean uh, in various different ways, um, except for the special cases, right? Except for special circumstances. So I'm actually going to drop the innocent person out of this because you might think that there are cases it's okay to kill an innocent human being. For example, maybe um, there's an innocent human being who has some terrible disease, which is spreading to others. They're not doing it maliciously. And by killing them, you're saving many lives. Maybe it's okay to bomb an enemy position, even though you know there's one civilian there. Um, but I think the Pope's point here is to say, it's wrong to kill a human being except for weird circumstances like self-defense or in wartime or to save many lives. None of those apply to abortion. So really what I think he means to be saying is just prima facie, it's wrong to kill a human being or pro tanto, it's wrong to kill a human being or it's wrong to kill a human being ceteris paribus. And those are just these Latin phrases which mean except, you know, this is wrong except for maybe there's overriding reasons in special circumstances. So we're going to go with premise one being premise one, prima facie, it's wrong to kill a human being. Premise two, a human embryo, fetus, we should probably add zygote, uh, is a human being. And then we get a conclusion. Uh, this little predator three dot triangle symbol is a fancy symbol for conclusion. And what is the conclusion? Well, it's prima facie, it's wrong to kill a human embryo, fetus, zygote. Now, this doesn't rule out for example, maybe sometimes killing a fetus is self-defense because it's endangering the life of the mother, right? Um, so the prima facie is doing a lot of work here, saying, you know, yeah, there's these special cases, but let's talk about the normal case. So the argument overall, again, premise one, it's prima facie, it's wrong to kill a human being. Premise two, a human embryo slash fetus is a human being. Therefore, prima facie, it's wrong to kill a human or embryo or fetus, which is what an abortion is. So the real problem with this argument is that it's invalid. Um, why is it invalid? Well, the problem is with it's the way that human, the phrase, or I guess the term human being is figuring into premise one and premise two. Um, premise one seems very plausible, acceptable on face value. Prima facie, it's wrong to kill a human being. But that's because we're thinking of human beings 
as persons, and I'll get a little bit, I'll talk a little bit more about what persons are in a, in a second. Um, persons being the special quality that separates us from plants, from rocks, from cows, right? That makes it particularly wrong to kill us. Um, that gives us special moral status. Uh, premise two is fairly indisputable, right? Except for it's only indisputable if we, by human being, we mean having human DNA or human biology, right? A human embryo slash fetus is clearly a human being in the biological sense. It's not clear whether they're a human being in the moral sense, in the sense of being a person. In fact, the entire debate about abortion often hinges on whether a human embryo slash fetus is a human being in the person sense. We all admit that they're persons in the biological sense, right? So there's a way in which this argument seems to work only because it, it's able to get you to accept premise one by thinking of human being in this sort of moral person sense, and then thinking of human being in premise two in this biological sense, which is an example of what we call the equivocation fallacy. That's when words shift meanings, words that have two different senses shift between them uh, during the progression of the argument. So here's an example of an argument that it commits the equivocation fallacy. Premise one, Clyde robbed a bank. Premise two, banks are the sides of rivers. Therefore, Clyde robbed the side of a river, right? clearly a bad argument and it's a bad argument because it's shifting meanings between the word bank uh from premise one to premise two and that seems to be what's going on with the with the pope's pope john paul ii's argument in this case <clears throat> so i already made a promissory issued a promissory note to explain more about persons so what the hell is a person and how does it differ from a human being what is this moral sense of a human being let's talk more about that so what is a person? Well, all right, let me pause real quick and do a little sidebar here. We need to talk a little bit about how words and concepts work, and then we'll talk about what a person is. So how do words and concepts work? Well, so for a long time, philosophers took for granted that words and concepts must be created through definitions that specify their meanings. So for example, um, I can introduce the word slash concept of a blog by defining blargs as rain, which is above 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And now we can go on using this word slash concept uh, because we know what it means, right? I've introduced this word, I've created it, I've created this concept by providing you a definition of its meaning. But uh, thanks to the work of a philosopher named Hilary Putnam and Saul Kripke in the 70s, philosophers realized that this isn't generally how words and concepts are created. And if you think about it, it's sort of obvious that that's not how all new words and concepts could be introduced, right? If every word or concept had to be introduced by defining it in terms of other words, words and concepts, we could never get started with introducing words and concepts. So how does this work? Well, Putnam and Kripke realized that words and concepts are more usually created by first connecting words and concepts to a referent, the thing that it's picking out, like what the word or concept picks out in the world, rather than providing a definition, i.e. words, the meaning or the sense of a word or concept. So for example, uh, the word <coughs> or concept of water was probably created by someone gesturing at the stuff in rivers, oceans, lakes, and, and the like, and saying, and then communicating the thought, whatever this stuff is, that's water. Now, having done that, he or she hasn't given a definition or the meaning uh, for the concept or word water. What such a person has done is connect the word to the referent out in the world. And now later, we can discover that water is H2O. That is only later we can discover maybe the definition or the meaning of the concept water. So what first gets introduced is a label for that stuff. And you kind of point to and realize the stuff that the word is supposed to be picking out in the world. And then later you find out the meaning or the definition. And that's very different from how we discussed blarg, right? I introduced blarg by giving you the definition, by defining it in terms of other words. Here, we're introducing a word or a concept, not by giving you the definition. I don't know what the word means. I just point to the stuff and I say, I'm introducing this concept to pick out that thing, whatever it is, 
And then when we find out what that thing is, now we know the meaning of the word or the definition of it. So similarly, we don't yet have a grasp, at least right now in this lecture, uh, of what a person is. But we can gesture at the thing in the world that the word concept names. Uh, then we have to investigate further to find out what the hell the thing in the world is that we've designated as personhood. So to begin, uh, we need to offer a description of personhood that isn't meant to define being a person, but one that merely allows us to see what the word or concept picks out, roughly, in the world. And then we can argue about what that thing is. So we need to figure out what persons, like what we're pointing to, when we use the word person, and then we can talk about, once we have that picked out, we can talk about what the definition of a person is. So we're not defining personhood, we're just trying to first point at it, and then we can investigate the thing we pointed at and what it happens to be. All right, great. So first task, fixing the referent of the concept, concept slash word person. And then second task, thinking hard about what that thing being referred to is in order to def discover the definition of the word slash concept person. So let's start with that first task. So I'm going to give you two moral dilemmas. Uh, <clears throat> there are two islands about to be overcome by a tsunami. You have a boat and have time to rescue one of, the in one of those individuals on only one of those two islands, or uh, the individuals on one of the two islands. <clears throat> on the first island, there are five mid-30s adult human beings on the second island, there is one normal 34-year-old adult human being. They're both strangers to you. You know nothing else about them. Everyone in this scenario are strangers to you and you lack any further information about them. What is, what island is the right one to guide your rescue boat to, right? Do you go to island one with five mid-30s people or do you go to island two with one mid-30s person? Well, the obvious answer is that you should take your rescue boat to the first island and rescue the five human beings over there rather than res rescuing one on island two, presuming you don't know anything else about these two pe these people, right? So it seems like five people matter more than one, right? The more you can save, the better. All right, here's, here's moral dilemma two. So there are two islands about to be overcome by a tsunami. You have a boat and have time to rescue those individuals on only one of those two islands. On the first island, there are two rocks, two cows, and a potted plant. On the second island, there are there is one normal 34-year-old adult human being. What island is the right one to guide your rescue boat to? I mean, aside from the philosopher Tom Regan, who might disagree, uh, almost every ordinary person and every philosopher would agree that you should take your rescue boat to the second island and rescue the one human being. But what makes him or her special over the five objects which are going to get destroyed on the first island? Whatever it is, that's what philosophers call his or her personhood, right? It's the thing that separates us from rocks, cows, and potted plants that makes it right to rescue one human being rather than five of those things. Whereas normally when you have five persons versus one person, you rescue the five persons, when we're talking about non-persons, rocks, cows, potted plants, it's better to rescue the person than those things. I don't even know if you have an obligation to rescue the rocks and the potted plant. Maybe the cows, that's even debatable. But the person seems like they not only outweigh those things, but there really is a moral responsibility to help them. So it is prima facie, so on face value at first glance, very wrong to kill a normally functioning adult human. Moreover, it's far more wrong to kill a normally functioning adult human than to destroy a rock or to kill a plant or perhaps to kill a rat or a cow. Perhaps it's wrong to destroy a rock or kill a plant or a cow, but there is something uniquely uh, unique about normally functioning adult humans which makes them especially wrong to kill or fail to rescue um, or the importance of rescuing outweighing these other things. For example, if you are put in a situation where you must choose to kill two plants or two cows or destroy two rocks or killing one normally functioning adult human, opting to kill the one normally functioning adult human seems like the seems like obviously the wrong choice. Ceteris paribus, which means except for in weird cases, like 
if the one person's Hitler, then yes, you should kill the one. You should not rescue that one nor normally functioning adult human. But the Setter's Paradise Clause says, you know, except for when there are overriding reasons because of a, of a special case. Great. Whatever that thing that makes normally functioning adult humans different in this regard, that's personhood, right? That's, I'm just picking out the referent of the word personhood, and then we're gonna talk about what personhood is, right? So we fixed the referent of the concept, and now let's move on to thinking hard about uh, what that thing being referred to is. So Marianne Warren is a philosopher. She has this great example of a space traveler. She says, imagine a space traveler who lands on an unknown planet and encounters a race of beings utterly unlike any he has ever seen or heard of. If he wants to be sure of behaving morally towards these beings, he has to somehow to decide whether they are people, whether they have personhood, and hence have full moral rights, or whether they are the sort of thing which he need not feel guilty about, treating as, for example, a source of food. How should he go about making this decision, right? So imagine you're in the space traveler's shoes. How do you differentiate the things that are like rocks or plants on this alien planet? It's very strange things on this planet and the things which are like us and deserve special moral treatment. Well, here's a couple potential answers to define personhood or give the meaning of the concept. Um, we might say to be a person, you have to have human DNA, human biology. Right. Um, that's a bad answer. Uh, it's not all that different from, I mean, you might as well just say that people with white skin are persons and have rights and people with brown skin don't. Right. It's it's just appealing to the superficial biological difference between two groups. Um, it also definitely does not seem like if we ran into a. Uh, a species of people, of a species of individuals which had developed culture, self-awareness, consciousness, could feel pain and suffering that we could communicate with, that we could just say, well, they don't have human DNA, so let's slaughter them for fun and eat, the, eat them, right? Break up their Martian families, kill them in, in terrible torture, right? It doesn't seem like just lacking human biology is enough to make you like a rock or a plant. It's, it's not this superficial feature. So let's go ahead and scratch that one off. But, well, actually, let's not scratch that off. Apparently I have a example to try uh, driving this point home. <clears throat> so there are two islands about to be overcome by a tsunami. You have a boat and have time to rescue those individuals on only one of those two islands. On the first island, there are five members of a non-human species who possess all the traits Marianne Warren specifies for personhood. We haven't gotten to that yet, but... Um, they're self-aware, they seem to have free will, they have families, they can feel pain and suffering, they're conscious, right? There's very advanced species on par with human beings. And then on the second island, there's one normal 34-year-old adult human being. What island is the right one to guide your rescue boat to? It seems like it might be the island with the five members of the non-human species, right? Uh, if you do decide to save the one human, this seems very... This seems similar to racism and sexism, choosing an island that has men or women on it because you're a sexist or white people, whereas the other island has brown brown or black or some sort of other minority. Um, well, minority depending on where you live. <clears throat> um, so here it seems like the obvious choice is to save the five non-humans on the island, on island one, rather than the one human on island two. Uh, to do otherwise is what philosopher Peter Singer calls speciesism, analogous to racism or sexism, right? It's a superficial spe feature that doesn't seem to impugn the moral status of the people on Island 1. Uh, and if I can say five of those non-human persons, um, I should, rather than one person on Island 2, which just happens to have human biology. So great, let's get rid of that. Um, another possibility for how to define a person is we think about, we say, well, persons are the things that are alive, that have lives. Um, I mean, among other things, that's gonna make plants, 
persons. I mean, it's going to make cows and rats persons, sure, but it's also going to make plants persons. Are you willing to commit to saying you should save five plants over one normally functioning mid-30s human? Uh, it seems like plants are do not have the moral status similar to you and I. Uh, they're not the sort of thing that we weigh in the same way that we weigh the value of our lives, right? Sure, it's our lives that matter, but it's not because we're alive. It's probably something to do with consciousness, that we're not, unlike plants, we're conscious living things, that we're self-aware, that we have free will. We, we can talk about all those other things that plants lack. So it's not just life. And, and just to drive home how sort of uninteresting and morally unimportant life is, I mean, think about what it would take for a self-driving car or bus to be considered living, right? You have a self-driving car, you program it to drive a certain route, maybe a bus on campus. When the bus needs to re refuel, it drives itself to the refueling station and fills up. When it's broken, it drives itself to like the mechanics bay and gets fixed, and then it goes back out and drives its route. I mean, is that a living thing now? Because it self-maintains and it self-derives and it self-nourishes? I mean... I mean, living things like plants just seem like squishy machines. And so it's life is a pretty minimal standard uh, and not something that we particularly find to have moral importance. We find the lives of conscious beings maybe to have moral importance, but not just purely living things. They seem like rocks, but if you complicate them a little bit and make them work like robots, but then they're just like disassembling a robot particularly one that's not conscious, doesn't have feelings, doesn't have thoughts, that's not going to be the sort of thing that we think has special moral uh, status. All right, so let's get rid of life. Now we're on to the more interesting candidates for defining personhood. So consciousness, that seems like a pretty good candidate. Um, there's a worry here, though, that consciousness is also a pretty low standard, right? Um, you know, I'm a vegetarian, I don't eat meat, and I don't think causing cats and cows and rats suffering is a good moral thing to do um but I, I i do think you should save one human being over the lives of 10 rats right so it's not like we think that i mean i i would claim that causing rats suffering is wrong but it's not because they're persons it's because suffering is bad um the lives of rats don't have special status just because they're conscious um or if they do it's definitely not the status that persons have right so call consciousness also seems like i mean there are philosophers tom regan among them who argue that consciousness is all that matters and i think tom regan would save two rats over one human being you know normally functioning mid-30s adult human being um but most of us are going to find that pretty implausible um, just to mention what like maybe consciousness is, uh, not to get too off topic, right? So here's one account from somebody I work with, Peter Carruthers. He argues that conscious states are globally broadcast, non-conceptual content. So conscious states are sensory in character, visual, tactile, audible. They involve non-conceptual content rather than conceptual content. This accounts for the seeming inexpressibility of consciousness, like to explain what red the experience of red is like. Um, seems impossible and conscious states are globally broadcast by appearing in the brain's global work so that's something that like normally parts of your brains aren't fully connected so there might be one part of your brain that can't transfer knowledge or data to another part and then there's sort of like this global workspace where all of the little modules in your brain can dump stuff into and then they all have access to it and so on Peter Carruthers account that's what consciousness is um, I, I go on this tangent only to to say if we think that consciousness is what makes you a person, then we have to explain what consciousness is. There are accounts of consciousness, uh, that being among them. Here is the best candidate for what a person is, some sort of higher order consciousness. Um, it's not just being able to see red, hear noises, feel pain and happiness. It's uh, some sort of self-awareness, ability to make like long-term plans, to think about oneself. Um, Marianne Warren is a philosopher who very famously wrote a paper where she argued 
that um, personhood involve these higher order traits rather than anything else we've already looked at. So she gave us five criteria for personhood. One is just simple consciousness. But then we've got other four other criteria. One is open-ended reasoning ability. Three is self-motivated activity. Four is the capacity to communicate in an open-ended way. And five is self-awareness. I always find four kind of weird. I mean, this wouldn't be the list I give, but um, these are things that are not just mere consciousness, but something special, which mid-30s normally functioning adult humans have and that rats don't. Um, <clears throat> I mean, here's something, here's an account of personhood that I might give or higher order consciousness I might give is like an interrelated cluster of capacities, like a package deal form of consciousness, conscious life that begins to arise around age two for human beings, which involves, you know, consciousness, which we get earlier, second order mental states. So beliefs and desires about our own beliefs and desires, wants to wants, beliefs about your beliefs, self-awareness, and the ability to not act for the strongest impulse of the moment, but instead hold yourself through willpower to a prior decision or belief about what you ought to do. That is the capacity that might be the idea we call free will, right? This would be my account of personhood, which makes us special, that plants and rocks and rats and cows lack. <clears throat> Um, second order mental states. So when do we get those? So here's just some, some s s cognitive science, social psychology research. So second order mental states or self-awareness. <clears throat> In one classic task, children listen to the following story enacted with props. Sally hides a marble in a basket and then leaves in her absence and moves the marble to a nearby box. Children are then asked where Sally will look for the marble when she returns. Beginning around age four, children typically answer correctly and point to the basket where Sally falsely believes the toy is. In contrast, most three-year-olds point to the box where the toy actually is, suggesting that they do not yet understand that Sally will have a false belief. This developmental pattern has been confirmed with tasks testing different false beliefs and with children from different countries. These highly consistent results have led many researchers to conclude that the ability to attribute false beliefs to others does not emerge until around age four. And you might assume the ability to, aid, to attribute false beliefs to others arises around the same time you can think about your own beliefs and think about people, not just about the world out there, but what people and yourself believe about the world and your own desires. So maybe self-awareness doesn't arise till around age four. Um, However, recent investigations using spontaneous response tasks suggest that this ability may be present much earlier. These tasks, children's understanding, sorry, in these tasks, children's understanding of an agent's false belief is inferred from behaviors they spontaneously produce as they observe a scene unfold, just as adults watching a movie may spontaneously produce results, responses that reveal their understanding of the character's mental states. Spontaneous response tasks currently include violation of expectation and anticipatory looking tasks. VOE tasks test whether children look reliably longer when agents act in a manner that is inconsistent as opposed to consistent with their false beliefs. So the point here being uh, there's a way in which psychologists can try to experimentally identify when we're, we start to arise the ability or start to have the ability to have beliefs not just about the world, but about beliefs themselves, about the beliefs of others and our own beliefs. And it might ar arise around age four, but you know, some tasks, some, some experiments show that it arises earlier. <clears throat> That's second order mental state seems to be pretty equivalent to self-awareness. And then lastly, let's talk really quickly about willpower. I'm gonna give another um, psychology test about this. So that this might, you might've been aware of this, but the marshmallow test, a child is offered a choice between one small reward provided immediately or two small rewards if they, are, if they wait a short period, approximately 15 minutes, during which the tester left the room and then returned. The reward is sometimes a marshmallow, but often a cookie or a pretzel. In follow-up studies, the researchers found that children who are able to wait longer for the preferred rewards tended to have better life outcomes as measured by SAT scores, educational attainment, body mass index, and other life measures. The point being, 
is that the ability to resist taking the marshmallow up immediately and wait for the second marshmallow over a course of 15 minutes, that's, that's willpower, right? That's the ability to resist temptation. That might be an ability that only, I mean, generally this gets tested on four-year-olds, but an ability that shows up, you know, not on month one, not on month six, but at some point by the time children are four years old. And these are the sorts of things that psychologists can test for. So here are two, two possible proposals for what is a person, two proposals that seem to take higher order consciousness as what makes somebody a person. Marianne Warren's on the left, my proposal on the right. I mean, my spitball proposal on the right. I don't mean to put too much weight behind it. Um, so when we look at the basic argument against abortion, uh, and now we have some sort of sense of what, what persons are, and I'm going to sort of proceed, not assuming, but with the strong tendency to think persons are things with this higher order consciousness. Premise one says prima facie, it's wrong to kill a human being because they're persons. Well, there are human beings who don't have personhood. Uh, seems like Fetuses might not have these like higher order traits that make us different from cows and rats. Um, and then in premise two, when it says a human embryo fetus is a human being, well, clearly that must, in order for that premise to be undebatable, it must think that um, human beings are, the, the phrase human being is referring to human DNA or biology rather than higher order consciousness because it's pretty clear that human f embryos and fetuses lack that. So great, so now we're in a position to talk about um, the basic argument for the permissibility of abortion. So premise one, prima facie, it is not wrong to kill a non-person. So killing plants, breaking apart a rock. Premise two, a zygote embryo fetus is not a person. Therefore, prima facie, it is not wrong to kill a zygote embryo or fetus. Um, Another way to put this is prima facie, it's wrong not to kill. It's not wrong to kill a non-person. A fetus is not a person. Therefore, it's not wrong to kill a fetus. So, <clears throat> an objection to this basic argument for the permissibility of abortion. We've already looked at the equivocation objection to the basic argument against abortion. Now we're going to look at sort of the obvious objection against the basic argument for abortion, which is the infanticide objection. Infanticide meaning killing infants. So higher order consciousness does not begin to appear until around age two. Maybe the psychology will show that it's a little earlier, a little later, but pretty late, not one month after birth. So around age two, when individuals go from being infants to toddlers. So if personhood amounts to the possession of higher order consciousness, then not just embryos slash fetuses aren't persons, infants are also not pot people. Consequently, if the wrongness of killing adult normal human beings is because of their personhood, higher order consciousness, then not just abortion is permissible, but also infanticide. Um, well, that's a pretty stark conclusion. Um, infanticide has become less accepted practice in modern times. One might see this as societal pro progress akin to the modern rejection of slavery. But if philosophers like Marianne Warren are correct, infanticide wouldn't seem to be the evil that the public has come to take it to be. Regardless, the practice continues and is even accepted in some parts of the world. The frequency of infanticide today is estimated to be about 2.1 per 100,000 newborns per year. Often infanticide is due to an economic inability to provide for an infant in extremely poor areas of the world. In these same areas of the world where disabilities cannot be pre-diagnosed before birth or abortion isn't available, infanticide can serve to eliminate a severely deformed or medically troubled infant, right? Um, in response to the infanticide objection, you might say, but is infanticide the murder of a person on the same level as murdering a normally functioning adult human? Is the permissibility of infanticide just an extension of Marianne's Warren argument for the permissibility of abortion, given that neither the fetus nor infants possess anything like higher order consciousness and so personhood? The response that many philosophers might make here is to bite the bullet. 
So biting the bullet is to accept an unpleasant consequence of one's position, which is to say, infanticide seems like you might want to reject Marianne Warren's argument on its face, but a number of philosophers might say, you know, this is a surprising consequence of thinking about morality, but it turns out infanticide isn't the terrible moral wrong we thought it was. Maybe it's permissible. Let's talk about biting the infanticide bullet real quick. Uh, an embryo, fetus, and even an infant below two years old are not persons. Therefore, it is no more wrong to kill them than it's to kill a cat. It may be wrong to cause a cat pain or to kill it painfully. But if we are fully willing to kill a cat for whom medical expenses keep to keep alive would cost $50,000, whereas doing that to your 12-year-old son would be, ter it would be a terrible wrong, this is because your 12-year-old son is his own person and deserves more. However, embryos, fetuses, and even young infants are not people and so deserve no better and no worse moral treatment than we give our pets or dogs or cats, or pet dogs and cats. Which is to say they deserve a lot, but not as much as actual people like a 12 year old, right? So that might be the way which we can bite the bullet for the infanticide objection to Mary Ann Warren's argument in favor of the permissibility of abortion. Um, but there's still one key difference between an embryo slash fetus and an infant, which makes it uniquely wrong to kill an infant in many cases compared to embryos and fetuses. After birth, parents can just give an infant away rather than kill it, usually. We might think that just as a pet owners are wrong to kill their pet dog if they are moving to a new apartment that bars pets rather than giving their dog away, parents are wrong not to give away their infant rather than kill it. But this is still to admit that embryos, fetuses, infants are not people and do not deserve the form of moral regard we give to normal adult humans but rather no more and no less than we get than the moral standing we afford our pets, which is a lot, but just not the amount we afford persons. Um, <clears throat> Peter Singer is a well-known, is a philosopher who's w well known for many contributions. He's often attributed with the starting the modern animal welfare movement with his book, Animal Liberation, and his paper, Famine, Affluence, and Morality is the starting point for any discussion on whether we have moral responsibility towards charity. And, you know, he's done much, much more in addition to that. There he is. He's an Australian. <clears throat> and here's a quote uh, by him from uh, on the infanticide objection. Uh, there remains one major objection to the argument I have advanced in favor of abortion, we have already seen that the strength of the conservative position lies in the difficulty liberals have in pointing to a morally significant line of demarcation between the embryo and a newborn baby. The standard liberal position needs to be able to point to some such line because liberals usually hold that it is permissible to kill an embryo or fetus, but not a baby. I have argued that the life of a fetus and even more plainly of an embryo is of no greater value than the life of a non-human animal at a similar level of rationality, self-awareness, capacity to feel, and so on. <clears throat> and that because no fetus is a person, no fetus has the same claim to life as a person. Now we have to face the fact that these arguments apply to newborn babies just as much as to the fetus. A weak old baby is not a rational, self-aware being and there are many non-human animals whose rationality, self-awareness, capacity to feel, and so on exceed that of a baby a week or a month old. If, for the reasons I have given, <clears throat> the fetus does not have the same claim to life as a person, it appears the newborn baby does not either. Thus, although my position on the status of fetal life may be acceptable to many, the implications of this position for the status of newborn life are at odds with the virtually unchallenged assumption that the life of a newborn baby is as sacrosanct as that of an adult. Indeed, some people seem to think that the life of a baby is more precious than that of an adult. Lurid tales of German soldiers bayoneting, bayoneting Belgian babies figured prominently in the wave of anti-German propaganda that accompanied Britain's entry into the First World War, and it seemed to be tactily, tact, tactily assumed that, or sorry, tacitly assumed that this was a greater atrocity than the murder of adults. 
I do not regard the conflict between the position I have taken and the widely accepted views about the sanctity of infant life as a ground for abandoning my position. In thinking about ethics, we should not hesitate to question ethical views that are not that are almost universally accepted if we have reasons for thinking they may not be as securely grounded as they appear to be. It is true that infants appeal to us because they are small and helpless, and there are no doubt very good evolutionary reasons why we should instinctively feel protective towards them. It is also true that infants cannot be combatants, and killing infants in wartime is the clearest possible case of killing civilians, which is prohibited by international convention. In general, because infants are harmless and morally incapable of committing a crime, those who kill them lack excuses often offered for the killing of adults. None of this shows, however, that the death of an infant is as bad as the death of an innocent adult. Newborn babies cannot see themselves as beings that might be, might or might not have a future, and so they cannot have a desire to continue living. For the same reason, if a right to life must be based on the capacity to want to go on living or to, on the ability to see oneself as a continuing mental subject, a newborn baby cannot have a right to life. Finally, a newborn baby is not auton an autonomous being capable of making choices, and so to kill a newborn baby cannot violate the principle of respect for autonomy. In all of this, the newborn baby is on the same footing as a fetus, and hence fewer reasons exist against killing both babies and fetus fetuses against those who are capable of seeing themselves as distinct entities existing over time. If these conclusions seem too shocking to take seriously, it might be worth remembering that our present absolute protection of the lives of infants is a distinctively Christian attitude rather than an ethical, a universal ethical value. Infanticide has been practiced in societies ranging geographically from Tahiti to Greenland and varying in culture from nomadic Australian Arib uh, sorry, Aborigines to the sophisticated urban communities of ancient Greece or Mandarin China or Japan before the late 19th century. In some of these societies, infanticide was not merely permitted, but in certain circumstances deemed morally obligatory. Not to kill a deformed, sickly infant was often regarded as wrong, and infanticide was probably the first, and in several societies, the only form of population control. So these passages are from a book by Peter Singer called Practical Ethics. So that's the biting the bullet response to the infanticide objection uh, to Marianne Warren's sort of personhood argument or the basic argument for in favor of uh, abortion or the permissibility of abortion just to give a summary before we move on um, it isn't prima facie wrong to kill a human being except because most human beings are people and it's prima facie wrong to kill people personhood seems to be connected to the traits we associate with higher order consciousness but this means that not only is abortion morally permissible but so is infanticide the permissibility of infanticide is somewhat constrained by the same restrictions on when we think people are morally permitted to euthanize their pets, but still the fact that embryos, fetuses, infants don't seem to be people leaves us with a very extreme and surprising result. However, if you expected a rigorous examination of ethics to just justify what you already thought was right, rather than reveal some surprising and uncomfortable counterintuitive truths about right and wrong, then you have the wrong intellectual attitude. A well thought out, consistent, and developed moral position will unavoidably force you to revise some of your initial and undeveloped moral commitments. Great. So that's Mary Warren, Marianne Warren and her personhood argument. Also, the Pope John Paul II's sort of basic argument uh, against abortion. <clears throat> uh, let's move on to some other arguments against abortion. Uh, we're going to talk about some bad ones, potentiality arguments, and then we're going to talk about one that might be pretty good. Don Mark Marcus's argument. So let's start with the potentiality argument. So <clears throat> sure, fetuses aren't persons, but we might say premise one, prima facie, it's wrong to kill a person. Premise two, an embryo slash fetus is a potential person. Therefore, prima facie, it's wrong to kill an embryo or a fetus. So what is a potential person in this argument? What is potential person in the sense invoked by potentiality arguments. Well, <clears throat> we might mean that there's a chance that in the future they will be a person. Um, here's an argument against 
interpreting potential person in that way. This is uh, an argument from Michael Tooley um, in, from his paper, Abortion and Infanticide from 1972. So Michael Tooley gives this example uh, of the personhood serum. Suppose that scientists develop a serum that when injected into a cat will cause them to develop the mental faculties necessary and sufficient for becoming a person. This means that the cat is now a potential person. Do we have an obligation to inject all cats we see with the serum? Thule's intuition, no doubt shared by many, is that even though every cat is now a potential person, we have no duty to inject them with the serum. In other words, there is no duty to take active steps to turn a potential person into an actual person. So, I mean, that's one way of arguing. I think there's a lot of reasons to reject this notion of potential personhood, uh, to reject the idea that when we mean potential person in this form of argument, that we mean that there's a chance in the future they will be a person. <clears throat> I think in general, when people make these sort of potentiality arguments, they mean something different. They mean that the potential person that they're already, they're, they're already a being that's in the process of growing to become a person, right? A cat and on, on one side of the room and a serum that turns the cat into a person, they're not, that cat's not already on the path to growing to become a person. So they're not a potential person in the sense that I think the potentiality arguments mean, which is something that's already developing to become a person. So let's in, so for example, consider the contrast between a sperm and a fertilized egg. Contrast an acorn dropped from a tree onto concrete versus an acorn landing on fertile ground and beginning its path of growing to become an oak, right? The sperm and the acorn that's dropped from the tree onto concrete, I mean, sure, in some sense, those are potential people, but they're not potential people in the sense that the potentiality arguments mean. The potentiality arguments, when they talk about potential people, they're talking about the fertilized egg. They're talking about the acorn that's on fertilized ground and already growing, right? So we're, we're talking, when we talk about potential people here, we're talking about things on the path of development to become a person. Um, I'm just going to point out that <clears throat> before the acorn develops, begins its path developing into a tree, it was an acorn just not developing into a tree. And before that, it was just bits of matter from the Big Bang. Anyway, all right. <clears throat> so now we have a, a sense of uh, what a potential person is for potentiality arguments. So there's a different problem for, or there's a problem with potentiality arguments, uh, which is pretty fatal to them. Um, this is not it. Uh, one objection is what about sperm? What about the use of contraception? Are we oblig uh, obligated to have as many children as possible since sperm are potential people? No, so long as by potential people, we mean things already developing into people as opposed to um, things that might be people. So that's not a great objection. Here's the better, uh, and then Michael Tooley sort of gives that objection with his kittens example. That's also not, I mean, it's the same objection, so we're setting it aside. <clears throat> the problem with this argument is also that it's invalid. Why is it invalid? Well, look at this compar comparably similar argument. Premise one, prima facie, a doctor deserves a high salary. Premise two, a medical student is a potential doctor. They're on their path. They're in developing to become a doctor. Therefore, prima facie, a medical student deserves a high salary, right? That's a bad argument. Why? Because if there's something true of a thing of X, it doesn't automatically become true that everything that's on the path to becoming an X also shares that property, right? So just because doctors have, <laughs> have the property of deserving high salary, that doesn't mean that students who are on the path to becoming doctors also now have the property of uh, deserving a high salary. They will once they're doctors, they just don't have it now. So we might think that, yeah, it's wrong to kill persons. It's wrong to kill normally functioning adult humans who have personhood. Fetuses don't have that. They're on the path to be having it, to eventually having it. But that doesn't mean that it's wrong to kill them. It just means that once they get personhood, it will be wrong to kill them. So this is an invalid argument. We can actually make it valid by adding a third premise. So suppose we add the premise, what is true of doctors is true of potential doctors. Uh, so then prima facie, a doctor deserves a high salary. 
a medical student is a potential doctor. Premise three, what is true of doctors is true of potential doctors. Therefore, prima facie, a medical student deserves a high salary. Now the problem, now, now we have a valid argument, but the problem is that it's unsound, right? One of its premises is just false, right? It's false that everything that's true of a doctor is true of a potential doctor. I mean, do you want to have your surgery done by a med student rather than a graduate? Um, so let's look at the, the comparable argument against abortion, the potentiality argument. Uh, it's invalid, right? It moves from saying something about persons uh, to saying something about potential p potential people. We can make it valid by adding a premise. What is true of persons is true of potential persons. The problem is that this premise seems unsound, right? Um, you Just because something's on its way to becoming a person doesn't mean it shares all the traits that persons have. Okay, <clears throat> so moving on to our first, I think, maybe good argument against abortion, or at least potentially successful one, uh, comes from a, a philosopher named Don Marquis, or Marcus, I never know how to pronounce it, from the University of Kansas, and he has a paper from 1989 called Why Abortion is Immoral, and this seems kind of like a potentiality argument, but it's different. We'll talk, we'll talk about it. So Marquis's argument starts by considering the question, what's so wrong about killing a person? Are persons like holy objects that it is disrespectful to destroy? Is it like smashing a nativity scene or like the artwork Piss Christ? I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's a crucifix in a jar of urine. Or is it like vandalizing war memorials? Marquis answers no. That's not why it's wrong to kill people. They're not these sacred objects that it's wrong to destroy because uh, it's disrespectful or sacrilege. We take it to be wrong to deprive someone of a great opportunity in their future. If you sabotage an Olympian such that their lifelong dream to compete cannot succeed, or a government sterilizes certain people to keep them from having and raising children, this is robbing them of certain goods from their future. Killing a person is like robbing a person in a similar way. Now, if you kill a cat, all you seem to have done is steal away, at most, future days of comfort and pleasure. But if you kill a person, you steal so much more. Marquis argues that what is especially wrong about killing people over killing cows or cats or plants or destroying rocks is the unique value of the lives of person. Sorry, the unique value the lives persons live, and so the future you are depriving them when you kill a person. So. It's not that I'm killing a person, destroying a person. It's that when I do that, I'm depriving an individual of the special value and rewards of the lives that persons live. So Marquis uses the phrase future like ours in order to fix the referent of what he's talking about when he says killing a person is especially wrong. I won't use that phrase. Future like ours doesn't mean to pick out a pleasant life or the life of the well-off or a first-worlder. It's just supposed to mark the difference between the future of a rock, a plant, and a cow on the one hand, and the life of a normal adult human on the other. Essentially, anyone who is living days, living, <coughs> is living days conscious and above the mental capacity of a two-year-old has the future like ours Marquis is referring to and that he argues is wrong to deprive a person of. Or, sorry deprive it an individual of. So <clears throat> if we look at Don Marquis's argument, prima facie, it is wrong to deprive an individual of their future time as a person. Prima facie, an embryo slash fetus is an individual with a future time as a person. Conclusion, prima facie, it is wrong to deprive an embryo slash fetus of their future time as a person, i.e. kill an embryo slash fetus via abortion. So this argument does, is not a potentiality argument. It's a valid argument. Notice we don't need to add an implicit third premise connecting potential personhood to actual personhood because Marquis's argument does not depend on it. It says, listen, it's wrong to kill persons because you're depriving them of their future days as a person. It's wrong to kill fetuses and embryos, not because they're persons, but because they also have futures as persons persons, right? It's not talking about embryos and fetuses being potential people. It's talking about how they have a certain future that you're depriving them of, just like 
it's wrong to kill a person, not because they're people, but because you're depriving them of a certain future. So note a few important features of Marquis's argument. This is just going to stress something I just said. Marquis's argument depends upon the idea that what makes it prima facie wrong to kill a person isn't the fact that possessing personhood gives an individual semi-holy status, which makes it wrong to destroy them, but rather because by possessing personhood, such an individual has a distinctively valuable future, which we are depriving them of when we kill them. <clears throat> but Marquis can allow that there are other additional reasons it can be wrong to kill a person. People can give consent or not in a way that plants cannot, and so killing a person might often be wrong for the additional reason that killing them violates their consent, assuming the person wants to live. For embryos, fetuses, and infants, however, this is beside the point because they can't give consent or or ask not to be killed. So if it's wrong to kill an infant or a fetus, it's got to be not having to do with consent. It's got to be to do with uh, the fact that you're depriving them of their future time as a person, future lives as a person. They're particularly valuable lives that only individuals that are persons can live. <clears throat> it isn't a potentiality argument. Marquis is not giving a potentiality argument. The wrongness of killing an embryo slash fetus is a property which both fully grown and normal functioning adults share with most embryos slash fetuses, which is having a future period time of time living the life of a person. And notice that Marquis's argument does not extend to giving rights to an embryo, fetus, or infant who will die before they're two years old, before they begin to live their life as a person, or people at the end of their life who are extremely senile and collapsed to the mental capacity below a two-year-old. It also doesn't rule out killing a person if they'd be killed a moment later by some other cause. Maybe that's an objection, maybe it's not. It's going to be a bullet that Marquis is going to have to bite. Uh, Marquis's argument depends upon the idea that we exist as individuals before we become persons. Personhood is a phase of our life, just as teenager is a phase we will enter at one point and exit at another, rather than something that's true of us our whole lives. So we can be deprived of our time as a person before we're people, because we existed before we were people. That's, that's important to Marquis's argument. This final point makes crucial to Marquis's argument when we begin to exist as individuals who will become persons, and when we stop existing. That is the question philosophers call personal identity. So that to, it is to that question I'm going to now turn. So now we're going to talk about um, personal identity and its relation to Don Marquis's argument. So when we talk about identity, we commonly have uh, one of two things in mind. Uh, one is qualitative identity, where two objects are qualitatively identical if they are exactly similar in all respects. Two objects are more or less qualitatively identical to the extent that their qualities are the same. Numerical identity, well, in numerical identity, two objects are numerically identical if in counting up the objects in the universe, the two of them are counted as a singular object. Consider a statue today and tomorrow after it's been painted red. While the statue before and after being painted red doesn't share all the exact same qualities, we still think of it as the same statue and therefore numerically identical. So what we're going to be interested in here and how it relates to Don Marquis's argument is numerical identity, identity. We're not interested in qualitative identity. So let's switch the title up there. So the starting point for any sort of discussion of these matters is a story called the Ship of Theseus. Uh, the Greek historian Plutarch famously wrote in his work on Theseus, uh, the ship wherein Theseus and the youth of Athens returned from Crete had 30 oars and was preserved by the Athenians down even to the time of ooh, Demeterus Phalerus, uh, for they took away the old planks as they decayed, putting a new and stronger timber in it their places, insomuch that this ship became a standing example among the philosophers for the logical question of things that grow, one side holding that the ship remained the same and the other contending that it was not the same. So Plutarch thus questions whether the ship would remain the same if it were entirely replaced piece by piece. So let's, uh, let, let's idealize the example a little bit to talk about the idea of numerical identity. Suppose the ship of Theseus is made of 100 parts and one is replaced each year. Then by year 50, only half of the parts will be OG, original. 
By year 100, 0% of the parts will be OG. Is the ship at year 100 the same as the ship at year zero? And if not, when did it switch? When did it become a new ship? So on the left-hand column, we have year zero. It's 100% original gangster there. And then uh, some other kind of distinctive moments in the history of this ship. At year 49, it's 51% OG. At year 50, it's 50% OG. And at year 51, we're now majority new parts where we're only 49% OG. Then at year 99, we have just one plank left uh, or one part left that is the same as the original ship. And then at year 100, we have a completely newly constructed ship, although maybe not a new ship. So it's 0% OG. So there are four potential answers we'll consider as to if it becomes a new ship, and if it does, when does it become a new ship? Uh, possibility, possible answer one, A1. It is a new ship as soon as one plank is replaced. There aren't one or two ships in this scenario, but a hundred. Sorry, there's a typo. Uh, the ship at year one is a new ship, as is the ship at year two, three, four, and so on. So that's our first theory. Answer two. It's a new ship once it is a majority of new parts and a minority of old parts, which is to say it becomes a new ship at year 51. Answer three, it is a new ship only once the last original part is replaced. Once it's all new parts, then it is a new ship. So in this case, it becomes a new ship at year 100. And lastly, answer four, it is never a new ship, even the ship at year 100, with all new parts is still the ship of Theseus, so long as the parts are replaced gradually and physical continuity is maintained, the ship will remain numerically identical throughout. Now, I'm not gonna talk about why answers two and three are unsuccessful. Uh, if you wanna take a moment or a couple moments to think it through, there's um, it's sort of a logic puzzle. If you think really hard about it, you can realize why those answers can't possibly work. They involve somewhat of a contradiction, which leaves us with answers one and four. So it's a new ship at every time any part is replaced. And answer four, where it remains the new ship, or it remains the original ship so long as the parts are replaced one by one. So I'm not gonna talk about answer one. I'm gonna focus on answer four. <clears throat> and the reason is when we start to talk about the thing that interests us, which is people, and what makes a person stay the same over time, it's really hard to accept answer one, right? We generally wanna say, you know, if I make a promise to you, I might lose some skin cells, I might change in some minor ways, and yet tomorrow, it's still me who made the promise and still owe to you what I've promised to you. Similarly, if a, if a criminal shows up to court after murdering someone several years ago, they can't say, well, I'm not the same person who did the murder because I've replaced some skin cells. Um, so when we're talking about people, it's really hard to accept the idea that uh, any change makes you a new person. So let's let's focus on answer four. So we're talking about personal identity, right? What what changes can people undergo and remain the same? And notice like us when we're infants are very different from us when we're teenagers, which is very different from us when we are elderly. So there's three sort of accounts of personal identity, accounts of what it takes for a person to stay the same over time, even though they're changing. So one is personal identity theory one. <clears throat> What's required is physical continuity, right? So it's very similar to the ship of Theseus answer four. Um, parts, physical parts can get replaced so long as the parts are replaced slowly, gradually, you can remain physically continuous with your previous self. So going from a baby to an elderly person, maybe all of your matter has been swapped out over that course of time, but it was gradual, and so you remain the same person. Um, <clears throat> there's an objection to this, a famous objection coming from the philosopher John Locke. It's his prince in the cobbler example. So imagine there's a prince up in the uh, castle, right? And the uh, locals are coming to kill him and string him up for the bad ways in which he's treated the uh, the locals, and luckily though the 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 prince has a mad scientist who's like I've got an idea, we're gonna go kidnap, we're gonna go kidnap a, the town cobbler. He's a very strong young man. You'll you'll love his body, 
And what we're going to do is I'm going to scan your brain, and I'm going to scan his brain, and then I'm going to rearrange the brain that's in your body to perfectly match the layout of his brain, and then I'm going to rearrange his brain and make it perfectly match the layout of your brain. And then we're going to put his body back in the cobbler hut, and we'll put your body back in the castle. So the question is, well, I'll, I'll, one more uh, elaboration on the story. So in the, mor the morning comes, uh, they both wake up, and the, cob the prince's body wakes up in the, in the castle, and it has all the memories, personality, etc. of the cobbler, right? So the, the person who wakes up in the castle feels like he's the cobbler who wakes up in this strange place in the castle inside of the prince's body. And then the person who wakes up in the cobbler's store has all the memories and personality and character traits of the prince. And the last thing he remembers is the mad scientist knocking him out in the castle. And then now he wakes up in the cobbler's uh, store inside the cobbler's body. So the question is, in the morning, when they both wake up, where is the prince and where is the cobbler? Right? We know where the prince is body is, the prince's body is in the castle, and we know where the cobbler's body is, the cobbler's body is in the cobbler's shop, but the personalities, the memories, the character traits, those have swapped, right? There's no matter change, it's just a personality swap, it's just a memory swap, it's a psychology swap. So where is the prince and where is the cobbler? If you're the, if you're the citizens looking to punish the prince for his mistreatment of you, do you go to the castle and kill the person who's inhabiting the prince's body, or do you go to the cobbler's hut and kill the person who's inhabiting the cobbler's body? Um, what Locke thinks this pushes us to accept is that the prince is now in the cobbler's body, and the cobbler is now in the prince's body. So we've got personal identity going not with your physical, your physical body, but instead with your psychology, right? So the idea here is personal identity is not a matter of keeping the same matter, it's instead a, a matter, uh, an issue of keeping the same psychology, which might change over time, right? Just like the ship might have parts that change your character traits, your memories, your beliefs, those change, but they change slowly, right? As long as there's continuity of your psychology over time, that's what makes you the same person. And if we track the prince's continuity psychology, it's in the prince's body up until the mad scientist does his work, and then all of a sudden his psychology is over in the cobbler's body. So that gives us our second account of personal identity, psychological continuity. Um, here's another objection, though, an objection to the psychological continuity account. So imagine there's a teleporter, and if you walk into the teleporter, it, fra it scans and destroys your body here. And on another planet made of completely different matter, it builds a new you, right? And that new you has the last thing it remembers is getting in the entry teleporter back on Earth. And on the new planet, it it awakens when it's constructed uh, with your personality, memories, etc. So you might think here, well, we have physical continuity being maintained, but it's a little hard to believe that that's the same person. It kind of seems like the teleporter in this case is not a teleporter, but a death machine, which then produces a clone, something that's not really you. Um, to really drive home that point, you could imagine somebody getting in the teleporter entry and getting destroyed and then having two teleporter exits and producing two copies of you. And now the question is, well, now we've got your psychological continuity connecting to two different people, but they both can't be you. So who's you in that scenario? Um, and that sort of offers this third account, which says, um, which is uh, put forth, well, among others, defended by Bernard Williams, who claims that personal identity is not just a matter of physical continuity, not just a matter of psychological continuity, but both, right? So in the Prince and the Cobbler case, physical continuity is broken. So in that case, what Bernard Williams would say is after the, the brain swap or the personality swap, um, both of you died and two new people came into existence. And then in the case of the teletransporter, what Bernard Williams would say when you enter the teletransporter, physical continuity uh, is broken, but psychological continuity is maintained. So in this case, it's, um, again, both of you die and new people are created. So for Bernard Williams, both things have to be maintained in order for you to remain the same person. So let's talk about personal identity. So now that we've got some idea about what maybe I am, maybe I'm a physical being, maybe I'm a psychological being, maybe I'm both, 
and what makes me the same person over time is either a psychological continuity or physical continuity or maybe both. Uh, let's talk about when did I come into existence? Me, Andrew Fife, the person who's talking to you, and when am I going to go out of existence? So if we look at the far left of this chart, 14 billion years ago, or roughly 14 billion years ago, there was the beginning of the universe, and the matter that I'm made of was created. And then around August 1955, my mother was born. Uh, a woman forms her eggs from birth, so the egg, presumably, that was fertilized, that became me, was created in 1955. In April 1981, or around there, thereabouts, the sperm was developed in my father, which would become me. Around June, July 1981, the egg in my mother begins maturing, that would become fertilized and become me. Around July 1981, my parents have sex. Um, and somewhere between zero and 10 days after sex, the sperm find its way, finds its way to the, uh, to the egg, and then over a 48 or 24 hour period, it fertilizes the egg. So it's not like instantaneous. Um, then uh, in December 1982, uh, you start to get some sort of fetal viability, right? So around 20 to 35% of those born at 23 weeks survive, while 50 to 70% at 24 to 25 weeks survive, and then over 90% can survive outside the womb after 26 to 27 weeks. Um, it's a little weird to say that I start existing there just because it makes when I exist dependent on how good technology is. Uh, as technology improves, um, all of a sudden people people start existing earlier because fetal viability goes gets pushed back. But anyway, moving on. Around J January 1982, uh, I start to have minimal consciousness, so I can maybe feel the warm bath of my mother's womb and hear noises and feel pain and pleasure. I don't think I'm forming memories at this point. That comes a little later. But I start to have some sort of consciousness. And then about two years after birth, I start to get these sort of higher order cognitive abilities like self-awareness and ability to resist temptation, follow through on decisions, etc. And then let's talk about when I might end existing. So around March 1987, uh, that's when I'm five. That's about the youngest age in which children have committed suicide. So maybe you think there's something special about a person having a desire to continue living. Uh, and we might wonder if that, co that, that correlates when people want to die. Um, around March 2007, I enter adolescence, or ad sorry, adolescence ends. I start to be, I'm 25. All right, and the rest is speculative. So 2030, Fife loses his memory and his psychological personality due to extreme senility. 2035, Fife suffers a severe brain injury and is reduced to the intellect of a one-year-old. 2036, Fife enters a permanent coma. 2040, Fife's body dies. Uh, 2040 to 2041, Fife's body is buried and decays, right? So the question is, given our account of personal identity, or the person, account of personal identity you accept, when did I start existing and when did I stop existing on this chart? So Marquis thinks his argument prohibits abortion at conception. And that thing, I think he, it's because he sees me, Andrew Fife, as a sort of human animal, which means I started to exist at conception and presumably I die or go out of existence once my body dies. So that's 2040. Um, great. You might still adopt Marquis's argument, but push back when abortion would be prohibited by it. Uh, if you think that you don't exist as a physical animal, but really you're a conscious being, you're a psychology, and that's definitely something you might think is correct if you adopt the sort of psycho psychology, psychology view or psychological continuity view of personal identity. In which case, you began, I began existing in January 1982 when minimal consciousness started to form, and then I die not when my body dies, but maybe when I enter a permanent coma in 2036. Um, something to note here, right, that this debate depends on what we think we as persons and our identities are. Uh, on Marquis's view, uh, we're phase sortals. So sortal meaning like sorting concepts. Uh, a designation which a certain thing comes to have for a period of time during its longer existence, i.e. a phase a thing passes through. For example, being a teenager is a phase we exist before and exist after. We only pass through a phase of being a teenager without there coming into existence a numerically distinct new object, a teenager, introduced into the world. Teenage me is just me, but as a teenager. Substance sortals are different. Not a mere phase, but a wholly new and numerically distinct object. For example, suppose an evil witch turns me into a rock. 
Is that rock still Andrew Fife? No. If this happened, Andrew Fife would have ceased to exist, and a new entity, the rock, would have taken his place. A new thing comes into existence with this change, not just a new phase of Andrew Fife, as is the case with Teenager. So Teenager is a phase sortal. Rock or inanimate object is a substance sortal. This phase substance sortal distinction provides us with a plausible way of defending the use of contraception, condoms, birth control, and rhythm method abstinence. Why am I not depriving Andrew Fife of his future when I refrain from sex or use birth control and thereby prevent a sperm that is me a chance to fertilize an egg and grow? Because I am no more, I can no more be the sperm that contributed to bringing me into existence than I could be a rock after a witch's curse. There is a sperm that will contribute to the process and matter that brings me into existence, but I am not that sperm. And the very, at the very least, once the sperm fertilizes an egg, then a new thing, Andrew Fife, comes into existence, similar to how if a witch were to turn me into a rock, I would cease to exist, and a new thing, the rock, would now exist, made from the material that once made me. The sperm ceases to exist when it fertilizes an egg, and a new entity comes to exist in its place, made from the same material. Being a sperm is not a phase that I, Andrew Fife, once went through, like how I was once a teenager. The sperm that became me wasn't me, but rather something that became me. Life as a sperm was not a phase of my existence. In counting up the objects that existed in the universe, the sperm that became me is one thing, and I am something different. So we have two things to count here, whereas teenage Fife and adult Fife are just phases of one and the same thing. Counting th the things that have existed, teenage Fife and adult Fife would only get counted once. But am I, Andrew Fife, the same thing as the embryo or fetus in my mother's womb? Or is the embryo and fetus like the sperm in the sense that they are things which became me but were not early phases of me, nor am I later phases of them? Perhaps I'm a person, not just as a phase like a teenager, like teenagerhood, but essentially. Then not only would the sperm not be me, but neither would be neither would an embryo, fetus, or infant. So. Uh, here's an example. A sculptor begins with a piece of clay. By shaping it into the right form, she creates a statue, which did not exist beforehand. If she tires of the statue, she can squash it, and so destroy it. Though squashing it does not destroy the piece of clay. Thus, the piece of clay is not the same object as the statue, for it exists before the statue does, and continues to exist after the statue is destroyed. Think of it this way. The sculptor began with a piece of clay. That's one object. She then created a new object, the statue. That's a second object. So after she finished sculpting, there existed two objects, the piece of clay and the statue. Thus, when I hold a statue in my hand, there are actually two objects there, a statue and a piece of clay. There only appears to be one, but there are really two. So great, so let's go back to our little chart. So you might think, and this is the sort of view that I, might, I would support, that I'm not just an animal that began existing at conception and then dies when my body dies. I actually think I'm not even just a consciousness, which started in 9th, January 1982 and then ends when I enter a permanent coma. I think I'm this higher order self-aware being, and that doesn't show up until around age two, and then it probably ends around the time where I lose my memory and psychological personality between ex because of extreme senility or maybe because I suffer a brain injury that reduces me to the intellect of a one-year-old. So on this account, personhood is not just a phase that I go through, but it is essentially one of my traits. It's, it's, it's the, um, I never existed not as a person, right? And this is really important to Don Marquis's argument because his claim is abortion is wrong because you are denying something that's not a person of its future as a person. Now, even he is not going to say that that can happen to sperm. We're not denying sperm its future, because sperm never becomes a person. It just turns into something new, and then that new thing becomes a person. But he's going to claim that after conception, that embryo and that fetus early on, that's me. It's just that I'm this glob of goo, this unconscious organism that will later on, as a phase, become a person. And you might think that that's not right. You might think, oh no, I'm not a physical animal. I'm instead this consciousness that inhabits the body just like a statue is sort of co-located with the lump of clay it's made out of. Um, in that case, abortion would not be permitted after January 1982 in my case, because I came into existence at when minimal consciousness shows up. I'm not a person yet. I go through that phase later. 
So you're not destroying a person, but you are destroying me, and I'm the sort of thing that's going to have a future as a person. Or, if you take the little purple square here, you think, no, Andrew Fife is a person, and he's always a person, and he never existed not as a person. Personhood is not a phase sortal, it's a substance sortal. So Andrew Fife is the substance that came into existence when a person came into existence. And, in, and if we take that position, Marquis's argument's not going to work. Because there's no point in time where I existed before I was a person. And therefore, there's no Andrew Fife to deny their future as a person, right? You can deny Andrew Fife the person of future time as a person, but you could, by destroying a fetus or an embryo, it's just like destroying a sperm, right? It's not me you're destroying, you're just destroying the stuff that would become me. So for Marquis's argument to work, I mean, he takes the blue box approach, which means that uh, abortion would be prohibited all the way back to conception. You could take like the yellow box approach and say, well, <clears throat> I didn't come into existence when the embryo formed, that's just this physical body, I'm actually the conscious entity. In that case, abortion wouldn't be permitted until about after the 24th week, right? Because that's when the thing that will become a person comes into existence and the thing that you could deny its future as a person. Or we could take the, the purple box approach and say, no, uh, Andrew Fife or us, we are nece necessarily people and we never existed before we were people. And in which case, uh, abortion would be permitted and Darn Marquis's argument can't work because uh, there's never a point where non-persons exist that will later become persons. So if we look at um, this sort of table of, or this, I don't know what to call this, uh, timeline of our lives, right? Uh, Marquis thinks that I began existing not when I was sperm, not at the beginning of the universe, but you know, once conception happened. So I, at some point, was a six-week-old embryo, and you can see this picture of a six-week-old embryo. And then I died, you know, after the, I was in a vegetative state, but sometime before I became ash. We could take the I'm a conscious being, sort of physical, psychological continuity approach to personal identity, in which case it seems like we might want to say that I started existing, not at conception, but around 24 weeks old when consciousness, uh, my consciousness started to arise in me. So that's still before I was a person, but... Uh, you might say that I'm a conscious entity and personhood's just a phase I go through. And then I continue to exist until my consciousness is snuffed out. Or we could take the more narrow view and say, I'm actually this higher order consciousness, which doesn't come into existence until around year two, and then would end before I enter that vegetative state. Uh, just to give a little argument for the sort of purple view, that I'm a higher order consciousness, that I'm a person, uh, let's look at some cases. So Terry Shrivo, she was um, uh, a woman in Florida a couple years ago. She had an irreversible persistent vegetative state from oxygen deprivation to her brain due to a heart attack. Alongside a, compa a, a comparison of, uh, her, it's, we have her, and then over here we have a comparison of her brain compared to a normal brain. The little black area is liquid while the white dot is a medical implant. Now, my question is, do you think that the per that the individual here is Terry Shrivo, or did Terry Shrivo die when she suffered the, um, when her brain basically died, right? Or because her body's still alive, and there's, there is some of her brain left running the sort of basic functions. That's the sort of case where I would think she's no longer Terry Shrivo. This is just an animal that used to be the body that Terry Shrivo inhabited, right? In the same way that you might beat up a statue and turn it into just a lump of clay, and that used to be the clay that was a part of it that made up the statue, but now it's just the lump of clay. The statue's gone. Uh, similarly, um, I don't think we were ever sperm, right? So just like you might think we're not ever embryos, we were never sperm. And then this is a good example. Like, do you think that there's much of a difference between the sperm on the left and the aborted embryo at week six on the right? It's hard for me to accept that I was ever either of these things. Um, it seems like I'm a, an entity which, if you were to today turn me into this embryo by a witch's curse, that would be killing Andrew Fife, just like turning me into a rock would be killing Andrew Fife. You wouldn't just be 
reverting me back to an earlier state. That's because I don't see myself as an organ, a purely physical organism. I don't even see myself as just purely a conscious being, but rather uh, a higher order consciousness. So that's sort of to push us towards a view that um, I started to exist over here on the right side with higher order consciousness. Let me point out one last thing about Don Marquis's argument. So he says, we became existing, we started to exist uh, at conception, right? That's when the egg is fertilized. Um, well, that's a little bit more complicated of a event than you might think, right? So first there's sex and then there's fertilization or conception that's around zero to 10 days after sex when the sperm finds its way to the egg. It's the fusion of two cells, a process that takes about 24 hours or so. This process is not complete until signamy, the point at which the genetic materials from the sperm and egg have thoroughly fused. It's arguable that no new entity exists until that point. And then there's implantation, which is a little later, uh, i.e. the embryo in adheres to the wall of the uterus, which typically occurs six days after fertilization. It is by this adhesion that the embryo receives oxygen and nutrients from the mother to be able to grow. Only at this point is the woman traditionally considered pregnant. Whether or not preventing implantation cons constitutes abortion or merely a form of preventing pregnancy is a controversial topic. Um, and then, uh, it takes about two weeks until you get to a state, like up until two weeks after conception, the, the cell might just split and then you get twins. And that's kind of a weird thing to say, like, um, I'm a person, but my physical existence might split into two. Like, where do I go in that case? Do I stop existing? Uh, do I go with one of those, do, if that sort of split into twins, is that... Is one of them me and one of them not me? Is is it that I die and now two new entities come into existence? It's a little. There's something a little weird. Maybe maybe not maybe not weird, but it's a little at least think worth thinking about whether uh, even on the sort of animal physical existence physical continuity account of personal identity, if you want to say that we started existing prior to. Uh, passing that two week mark when um, there's not a risk of splitting into two different beings. Um, just a quick note about birth control, right? There's a couple different forms of it. Birth control, condoms, the rhythm method, abstinence, those all are ways to prevent sperm from fertilizing the egg and getting pregnant that way. Plan B is something you can take, I think about one or two days after sex and uh, it prevents um, fertilization. It basically prevents the sperm from finding the egg. Um, there's some controversy about whether it also prevents the egg from uh, adhering to the uterus wall. And of course, then that's controversial whether that counts as an abortion. But the standard way in which Plan B works is that it just prevents um, fertilization. And then there's RU486, which is a pill you can take long after you became pregnant. And this is just an abortion pill. It basically instigates a miscarriage. Um, I'm not sure how late you can take the RU486, but it's maybe like 12, at least 12 weeks into your pregnancy. So birth control, condoms, rhythm, method, abstinence, not, not abortion. Plan B, probably not abortion. At least in most cases, there's a question of whether it actually ever prevents a fertilized egg from adhering to the uterus wall. And then of course, that's a question, there's a question whether that even counts as an abortion. And then, then we have, we have the abortion pill, which is RU486. Yeah, well, I guess I, I skipped ahead here. So conception is actually quite a complicated phenomenon. During the first two weeks after conception, the cells are only loosely grouped together. They're independent and uncoordinated. And at least until the eight cell stage, each is a totem pot that is capable, if separated from the others, of developing into or giving rise to a complete adult organism. So I guess if we just split the cell in two, you would become a twin. You'd grow into two separate things. It is this lack of integration among the cells that suggests that they are not, they do not constitute together, sorry, do not together constitute a distinct entity, an individual. We may maintain that an organism begins to exist only later when the proliferating cells lose their totem potency, become differentiated, and begin to, to be tightly aligned both organizationally and functionally, right? So here's an account that even if you want to push, uh, our existence back to conception. Maybe you, you don't want to put it all the way back to fertilization. I mean, you definitely don't want to push it all the way back to sex, right? Because you want to, at, at, the, at the earliest, it's fertilization of the egg. You might want to only push it back until the fertilized egg attaches to the uterus wall. You might want to not even push it back until 
two weeks after conception when um, the cells lose their, lose their totem potency. Uh, twinning is a possible anytime during the first two weeks in cases in which uh, monozotic twinning occurs, the zygote divides to form two qualitatively identical zygotes. Great. So that's Don Marquis's argument on personal identity. Remember, his argument is um, it's not what's wrong about killing a person is that you're denying the person of their future days as a person. But of course, if you ever existed before the time you were a person, we could deny you of your personhood, even though you're not currently a person. But that depends on you of existing before you were a person. So that depends crucially on the account of personal identity we adopt. And when we pinpoint the beginning of your existence, because that would be the point where even if you weren't a person, you began existing and then you could be denied your future as a person. And we might adopt an account where you never existed not as a person, that you came into existence at the same time you acquired personhood. In which case, Don Marquis's argument would have no room to get its teeth, uh, teeth, into, uh, teeth into the argument. I'm not sure what the analogy I'm trying to make here is. All right, so uh, let's talk about J.J. Thompson's violinist. Okay, so now we're going to move on to talking about J.J. Thompson's uh, famous violinist case. So J.J. Thompson was a, or I guess as of, I'm sorry, J.J. Thompson's apparently still alive. Um, she's a faculty at MIT. She's famous for, among other things, writing a paper on abortion in 1971 called The Defense of Abortion. And um, let's stop here for a second. <clears throat> um, so this paper argues on abortion in a slightly different angle. So J.J. Thompson says, let's just assume for the sake of argument that the fetus is a person and it does have rights. Or maybe that the fetus isn't a person, but Marquis's argument succeeds and it's not a person, but it's still wrong to kill it for the same reasons it's wrong to kill a person because you're depriving an individual of their future time as a person. Thompson points out that even then, there are times where it's right or permissible to kill a person, right? Easy cases like self-defense might be okay to kill a person. Um, and so she's going to make an argument that assumes that the fetus is a person and yet say, in most cases of abortion, it's still permissible to have one. So let's start by considering um, three cases that don't seem like they have anything to do with abortion and then i'm going to slowly work our way up to thompson's uh, violinist argument you might also notice that like we're on hour two so i'm starting to get a little uh it's a little hot here i'm starting to uh unwind i suppose anyway all right so um consider this case uh jim and kim are homeowners living in a different suburban neighborhoods one thing that jim and kim's neighborhoods have in common is that they are both places where many children live and tend to often roam and play freely in the streets. Something Jim and Kim themselves have in common is that they both happen to want a backyard pool so that they might better endure the summer's heat. Neither Jim nor Kim have a fenced-in backyard, but in building his pool, Jim splurges the extra money to have a sturdy fence built around his backyard in order to keep neighborhood kids from being tempted to swim in his pool when he isn't home. Kim, on the other hand, doesn't care. Let's say that both Jim and Kim have the following unfortunate outcome happen to them. A very young neighborhood kid, eh, around six years old, sneaks over to swim in their pool while they are at work and drowns. Jim and Kim don't need pools. And furthermore, by building pools, they introduce risks to the neighborhood, to neighborhood children that did not exist before. Are Jim and Kim morally blameworthy for the children who drown in their pools by creating the drowning risk in the first place? Is it morally permissible to have a backyard pool? I take the answer to be yes, it's fine to have a backyard pool, particularly in the case of Jim, who builds, who is not negligent and is concerned about making sure that by building the pool he's not introducing risks to neighborhood children's. That's why he builds the sturdy fence around his pool. Um, but, you know, nevertheless, no matter what precautions you take, they might not be enough. Still, it seems to be too much to ask of Jim 
that he never build a pool, that he, he never do anything that might risk injuring someone else like building a pool in order to avoid being blameworthy for when bad consequences result from his, his la actions or his way of life. Kim, you know, she's a little more, um, she's a little less sympathetic. Uh, you might think that she is negligent in not building the fence. Maybe you think it's her property. She can do whatever she wants, so she's not responsible at all. But, but at the very least, it's a little more questionable whether Kim is morally blameworthy for building a pool and then not bothering to build a fence around it, knowing that there are neighborhood children who are inevitably going to try sneaking into her pool when she's not around. And because they're unsupervised, they might, you know, drown or engage in, um, as kids do, uh, dangerous behaviors and injure themselves or kill themselves. Okay, first case. Second case, Alan and Brian both drive to the pub to watch the game with friends. Alan drinks very little or none at all at the bar, knowing that he has to drive home later. In either case, Alan is in no way impaired once he leaves the bar several hours later. In contrast, Brian gets absolutely sloshed. Brian stumbles out of the bar and after fumbling with his keys for a bit, manages to get into his car and start his drive home. Let's say that on both of their drives home, there is this complicated intersection that tends to result in wrecks. Alan leaves the bar around four and while driving home through this intersection hits and kills a pedestrian. The wreck wasn't really due to any driving mistake of Alan's. It was due to circumstances no driver could have adverted. So say the intersection has this way in which if the sun's at a certain point in the sky gets in your eyes and you can't see if there's a pedestrian or not. And that's why Alan ends up hitting and killing a pedestrian. A few hours later, Brian is driving home and also hits and kills a pedestrian. And in his case, let's assume that's because he was drunk. So Alan and Brian don't need to watch the game collectively with friends. And furthermore, by driving to watch the game elsewhere, they introduce risks to pedestrians that would not exist if they had just stayed home. Are Alan and Brian morally blameworthy for the pedestrians who get hit simply by putting them at risk by driving to an unnecessary event in the first place? Is it morally permissible to travel in a car when not absolutely necessary, right? So both of them could never drive except for to work and to the grocery store to get food and then, you know, engage with friends over the phone, play video games at home, but never um, introduce the risks to other people when you're driving around a three-ton metal death machine on the roads that, you know, you're, you're never going to hit somebody if you're never driving your car, right? And so every time you get in it, when it's not absolutely necessary, you're putting people at risk that you don't need to. That seems like a really bizarrely strong standard to hold people to, right? So Alan, who is perfectly sober when he hits and kills someone of no fault of his own, we think, you know, he could have not driven his car. He could have stayed home. He could stay home on every occasion except for when he absolutely has to drive. But that seems like too much to re require of people, right? Like, it's such a small risk. It's such an important part of human life to be able to get around, hang out with friends, to not be a hermit, to make a life worth living. You can't close yourself off like that. So for Alan, it seems like we don't want to blame him for what happens, even though he introduced the risk in the first place by driving to something he didn't need to. It's because the risk is so small, presumably, and it's because it, he's engaging in activities that are sort of necessary for a life worth living. Brian, on the other hand, he seems negligent, he seems blameworthy because he didn't just introduce risks by, by driving his car unnecessarily, he did it to a, a vast degree, right? He got drunk and drove, and that seems to be something you don't have to engage in in order to live a life worth living, and it also seems like it introduced dramatic risks to pedestrians. So in this scenario, just like the previous one, Alan seems blameless, Brian seems blameworthy, they both introducing risks to others, they don't have to, but there's something about Alan, there's something about the first person that seems like it's not negligent, it's a part of living life, it's a sort of risk that you're allowed to introduce to other people but not then be on the hook if bad consequences result because it's a part of, it's a necessary part of living a life worth living and it's such a small risk, right? Whereas Brian seems like he's blameworthy. All right, one last case, again, very similar to the first two. 
Uh, Sue loves baseball, <clears throat> and Ryan loves drag racing. Unfortunately, what Sue and Ryan have in common is that, per that participating in their beloved activity, they unintentionally cause someone's death. Sue hits a fly ball that happens to leave the field of play and strike a pedestrian in the head, killing him instantly. While drag racing late at night through the city streets, Ryan strikes and kills a pedestrian that wasn't expecting a car to come twisting around an inner city street corner at 80 miles per hour. Sue and Ryan don't need to play sports like these. And furthermore, by playing baseball or drag racing, they introduce risks to others that would not otherwise have existed. Are Sue and Ryan morally blameworthy for the deaths that resulted from their actions? Is it morally permissible to play baseball or drag race? Again, if, if we think that Sue is blameworthy, then it seems like we have to live the lives of hermits, right? Like she is introducing a tiny risk and she's engaging in an outdoor activity. Like she could stay home. She could restrict herself to playing chess um, alone. Uh, there's a worry here that it's too small of a risk and too trivial of a thing and too important to a valuable human life to engage in activities like baseball, not baseball in particular, but all the sort of equivalent activities that put people at risk. But it's such a small risk and such a necessary part of human life that we don't blame people when that small risk turns out to lead to something bad. Whereas with Ryan, it seems like he's going above and beyond in being negligent, right? He's not doing something that's necessary to human life, and he's not doing something that only introduces a negligible risk to others. He's doing something way over, beyond, over and above what we might think is permissible risk to introduce to others when you're living your life. Great. <clears throat> so what I, what I mean for all three of these cases to sort of introduce or to support is this the idea of this the present thesis, the, what I'm going to call the right to a life worth living thesis. This is not something that J.J. Thompson explicitly says, but I think this is the point of some of her examples in her paper. Uh, people are within their rights to pursue interests vital to a life worth living in such a way that if their pursuits fall below a certain threshold of risks for morally bad outcomes, such that they are thereby not, such that they are thereby not responsible for any morally bad outcomes that might result from their pursuit of said interests, right? So this is supposed to be the distinction between the first person in all three of those cases and the second person in all three of these cases. The first person in all three of these cases seem like that's just a part of not being a hermit. That's just part of living a life worth living is to introduce those sorts of engaged activities that introduce that sort of mild, tiny risk to others. Whereas the second people and second person in all three of those cases seems like they're not protected by the right to a life worth living thesis because they are introducing drastic risks to others in engaging in activities that are not necessary to a life worth living. Okay, so keep this thesis in mind. We're going to come back to it. Uh, let me introduce J.J. Thompson's violinist. So you wake up in the morning and find yourself back to back in bed with an unconscious violinist, a famous unconscious violinist. She has been found to have a fatal kidney ailment and the Society of Music Lovers has canvassed all the available medical records and found that you alone have the right blood type to help. They have therefore kidnapped you, and last night the violinist's circulatory system was plugged into yours so that your kidneys can be used to extract poisons from her blood as well as your own. If she is unplugged from you now, she will die. But in some months, she will have recovered from this ailment and can safely be unplugged from you. Is it true that you may now morally permissibly unplug yourself from the violinist, even though this will cause her death? You might say no, but most of you will say it's okay. It's permissible to unplug yourself. The idea here is you're not responsible. You didn't put the violinist in their position, so you're not obligated to keep them alive to stay in this hospital for several months and to like divert your life in order to keep them alive. So it's okay to unplug yourself and leave even though you can see that this will kill them. It's not like you were the one who gave the violinist their kidney disease. <clears throat> Some of you might say it's obligatory for you to stay, but Thompson is trying to speak to the people who think it's okay to leave. Now, Thompson does wanna say that there's something good, morally good about staying uh, and what she wants to say is that it's superogatory, which means moral extra credit, something good to do, but not bad not to do. So you're not bad for leaving and unplugging, although you are a moral saint. 
you are doing something extra over and above morally good if you stay, but you're not obligated to stay is what Thompson thinks. So we've got the sort of standard three classifications for the actions in moral theory. So first is moral obligatory, actions which an agent is morally praiseworthy for performing and blameworthy for not performing, so actions that are good to do and bad not to do. Uh, morally prohibited actions, actions which an agent is morally praiseworthy for not performing and blameworthy for performing, that is, actions that are bad to do and good not to do. And then actions which are morally permissible, actions which an agent is not morally praiseworthy for performing nor blameworthy for not performing. So therefore, actions that are neither bad to do nor good to do. And now Thompson's interested in this fourth category, uh, actions which an agent is morally praiseworthy for performing but not blameworthy for not performing. That is, actions that are good to do, but not bad not to do. So she thinks staying in the hospital in the violinist case to keep him alive is supererogatory. It's good to do. It's praiseworthy to do that. But it's over and above. It's extra credit. You don't get demerits for not staying. It's not blameworthy for leaving. It's not bad for you to leave because you're not responsible for that violinist's life. There's a fifth category of action we could define, but it's a category of action that philosophers strongly suspect doesn't actually exist. Subogatory, actions which an agent is not morally praiseworthy for not performing, but is blameworthy for performing. So actions that are bad to do, but not good not to do. <coughs> um, don't think too much about it, but the lack of sub subaguration so reflects the fact that the good is open-ended in a way that the bad is not. You can do more good than is required of you, and then that is to your merit. But you cannot do more bad than the bad you are prohibited from doing. Don't worry about that. This is just sort of a fifth po logically possible category of actions that doesn't seem to actually exist. <clears throat> so let's talk about superaggregation again. Um, here's a, a passage from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy's entry on superaggregation. Uh, superaggregation is the technical term for a class of actions that go above and beyond the call of duty. Roughly speaking, supererogatory acts are morally good, although not strictly required. Although common discourse in most cultures allows for such, such acts and often attaches special value to them, ethical theories have only rarely discussed this category of actions directly and systematically. A conspicu conspicuous exception is the Roman Catholic tradition, which gave rise to the concept of supererogation and the virulent attacks on it by Lutherans and Calvinists. Surprisingly, the history of supererogation in non-religious ethical theory is very recent, starting only in 1958 with J.O. Urmson's seminal article, Saints and Heroes. So <clears throat> let's talk about J.J. Thompson's violinist. So she thinks that here's a case where someone's life depends upon you, but you're not responsible for keeping them alive. And so it's moral extra credit, it's super augatory for you to stay and keep them alive in this hospital. But it's perfectly permissible for you to unplug and leave. You're not blameworthy for killing them if you get up and leave. Jada Thompson's violinist case is very clear, gives us a very clear analogy with abortion in the cases of rape, right? So if a woman becomes pregnant because of rape, there's a fetus whose life depends upon her, Pregnancy involves a lot of strains on the woman, and particularly maybe in cases where the pregnancy is due to rape. And Thompson wants to say, in cases of rape, it would be supererogatory, more extra credit to your merit if you decided to keep, keep the pregnancy and bring it to term, right? It'd be nice of you to do it if we assume that fetuses are persons. Um, but it's not bad for you to have an abortion because just like the violinist Violinist life is not your responsibility. In this case, in the cases of rape, the fetus's life is not your responsibility. It's not, it's not obligatory for you to keep the fetus alive, just like it's not obligatory for you to keep the violinist alive in J.J. Thompson's case. Now, that doesn't defend abortion in a whole lot of cases, right? Just in the, case of abort just in the cases of rape. But Thompson's going to extend this even further. J.J. Thompson wants to extend her violinist case to make an analogy with abortion in the cases of failed contraception, right? So when a woman is using contraception, like condoms or the birth control pill, and it fails due to, say, a factory defect in the condom, 
she wants to say it's also just like rape not the woman's responsibility it's not her fault she was not engaging in activity that makes the pregnancy and the life of that fetus her obligation now you might say you might think immediately well how can that be true she had sex and she knew that contraception is not 100 percent effective well <clears throat> um a couple things one is you can always expect more of even rape victims right you could always say well it's your fault because you didn't have a hysterectomy at 18. if you had a hysterectomy at 18 when you got raped you wouldn't have gotten pregnant so actually this pregnancy is your fault or you left the house or you went to a party right it seems like you could start to try blaming the woman for not doing absolutely everything to an absurd degree of even becoming a hermit and never leaving the house and having a hysterectomy at 18 in order to avoid getting pregnant due to rape otherwise we hold her responsible for that pregnancy and that seems absurd and Thompson wants to say similarly it's absurd to expect women to not engage in sex to cut it out of their life even when there's contraception which is 99 percent effective in order to avoid responsibility for the pregnancy if the condom breaks right if it's a act of god if it's a f factory defect which she wants to say <clears throat> makes the pregnancy not the woman's fault and the life of the fetus not her responsibility just like in cases of rape just like cases in cases like her violinist example now <clears throat> um I want to bring this back to the three cases we talked about before with the right to a life worth living. Um, I suspect that a lot of you found that thesis pretty convincing. <clears throat> that applies here, right? Because we don't expect, even if a woman doesn't have a hysterectomy and she's willing to leave her house and, I don't know, consort with men outside of the home, she puts herself at risk of rape, but we don't think that that makes her responsible for the pregnancy if she's raped right you don't have to become a hermit to avoid responsibility for the bad consequences of living your life in a responsible way that avoids putting too much risk on other people right just like driving outside of your house when not absolutely necessary like playing baseball or building a pool with a fence having sex with a condom is just a nest like a crucial part of human relationships human love human life and to say that you can't engage in that even when you can reduce the risk of getting pregnant to a very negligible negligible degree without being responsible well that's similar to saying people shouldn't play baseball because it introduces risk to others people shouldn't drive their cars because it introduces risk to others just by being on the road she wants to say <clears throat> that sex with reliable contraception is something that's a necessary part of a human life worth living that only introduce a negligible risk to others namely the fetus if it's a person um, such that you're not responsible for the bad outcome it's just a fluke of the world if the contraception fails now if you don't use contraception and you engage in sex now she might she might she might be committed to saying you are responsible for that for that pregnancy and it would be wrong for you to have an abortion but in the case of reliable contraception it's just you engaging in a necessary part of not a necessary part but like a crucial part of human life I, and just to point out i think a lot of people have a mistaken view of who has abortions i think it's over half of the women who have abortions are women who already have their first child many of them have husbands or they live with a boyfriend right it's not necessary in, in, in many cases it's women who are later in their life who just don't want to have another kid um, and who get knocked up by their long in, by their long-term love partner right and it seems like um, it would be too much to require of women to say that don't engage in sex with your long-term love partner uh, otherwise even with contraception because if the contraception fails you're res you're responsible for the result that seems very similar to saying don't ever play baseball because if you hit a fly ball 
and it ends up hitting, killing, hitting and killing somebody outside the field, you're just as bad as a drag racer on the streets, and you're responsible for that. You should be a hermit. You should stay in your home. You should never leave and put anyone at risk except when absolutely necessary to keep yourself alive. That seems like too high of a standard. And Johnson wants to say to demand abstinence, lifetime abstinence from women is, um, or is, is too much to demand of people, uh, particularly when the risk of pregnancy is so negligible when contraception is used um, consistently. So let's look at an objection to J.J. Thompson's argument. We might object that a zygote embryo fetus is related to the woman carrying it, and so she has a special responsibility to providing for it, which she doesn't have for the violinist in Thompson's example. So the Thompson's example, the violinist, it's only it's supererogatory to stay. It's permissible to leave. You're not responsible for him. But we might say, well, but in this violinist case, he's a stranger. Whereas in pregnancy cases, it's not a stranger. It's your child. Um, I, I, I mean, you can press this objection. I never find it very convincing. Uh, I think that, you know, adopted parents have a responsibility to the children they adopt. The biological parents who put them up for adoption aren't, don't have that responsibility. Just a blood connection, a DNA connection doesn't mean that you have this magical special relationship that requires, gives you obligations to people. Um, most I would, I would argue that our obligation to our parents and our brothers and so on comes from like the friendship we uh, come to have with them. Like it's a very particular kind of friendship. So it's similar to the bonds of friendship or maybe the bonds of loyalty of somebody who's done something for you. But if you have some parent who gets pregnant and then immediately gives up the child and then the child's adopted by someone else, it doesn't seem like the biological parent has some sort of special responsibility towards that person. Um, or I would argue not. But you, you could object to Thompson on these grounds. Um, imagine, but in thinking about this, imagine a case where uh, a couple with an infertile wife decides to ask their best friend to carry their child. So the husband has sex with the woman's best friend, the woman best friend, the, the best friend gets pregnant, carries the child to term, gives the baby back to that couple, and they raise it as their own. Do we think that? I mean, I think that the mother in the relate in the in that couple has obligations to the child. Not due. I mean, the child has no blood relation, no DNA relation to her. But I think that she, the, she's really the mother. She's the one who opts to take care of this child. She's the one who develops a friendship and a care relationship with the child. The person who is merely the oven where the child was baked, right? The the carrier of the pregnancy. Uh, I can't see a special responsibility tagging her just because of the DNA relationship, just because of the biological relationship. But maybe you disagree. This is an objection you could press to Thompson's violinist case. Final <clears throat> a final thought on uh, Thompson's violinist case. It only comes to play into play if we think a zygote, embryo, or fetus, or infant is a person, or if Marquis is right. Has the same moral right to not be killed as a person. If we don't agree with that, then we don't need to involve J.J. Thompson's argument because there isn't anything that has a right not to be killed who we have to worry about not killing, right? So if the fetus is not a person or the embryo is not a person or there's that, you can just have an abortion because you want to have, because you're, you get pregnant and then your husband leaves you and you decide you don't want to have his kid. That's perfectly fine, even if you weren't using contraception, even if you were trying to get pregnant, right? If the fetus isn't a person, then killing a fetus is no different than putting down a cat, right? Now, if the fetus is a person, and that's where Thompson comes in, in that case, she wants to argue, well, even if it's a person, as long as the pregnancy is not your fault or the life of the keeping the light, the the fetus alive is not your responsibility or your obligation, it's okay to have an abortion. And that's the case in instances of rape, but also failed contraception. That's what J.J. Thompson's argument is. Okay, so that's J.J. Thompson's argument. All right, last one. Dan Moeller and moral risk. And this is, um, <clears throat> I think, one of the most interesting arguments against abortion. We've already looked at Dan Marcus's, which is not bad. Uh, Dan Moeller's, I think, is... Uh, very troubling 
uh, for if you if you're if you're pro-choice. Uh, so Dan Muller is a faculty at the University of Maryland, and he has this notorious paper paper on abortion that he gets a lot of grief for. Uh, and he has a new book out I would recommend called Governing Least, Defending Political Libertarianism. But anyway, the paper is called Abortion and Moral Risk. It came out in 2011. So suppose you were confronted with two buttons. One button you are fairly sure won't kill anyone. Let's say you realize there's only a 1 in 2,000 chance that pushing it will kill an innocent person. Whereas the second button will certainly bring you significant personal troubles, say you'll lose your job, but at least has a 0% chance of killing any innocent person. Assuming that you have no choice but to push one of the two buttons, do you think you are morally obligated to avoid the moral risk of killing an innocent person, even at great cost to yourself? I mean, I would tend to say yes, you should push the second button. You lose the job, but you're not putting an innocent person at risk of death. Moeller thinks you should push the second button, right? That you shouldn't take the risk of killing an innocent person. So if we accept Dan Moeller's judgment about the button case, this provides us with an argument against the morality of abortion. Specifically, even if we think the arguments in favor of the permissibility of abortion succeed, Marianne Warren's argument or J.J. Thompson's, and that the arguments against abortion fail, like Don Marquis's argument, we can't be 100% sure we are correct. We have to admit a chance that in this complicated philosophical issue, we got things wrong, and that in fact the arguments claiming abortion to be murder are correct. Consequently, even if we accept the arguments for the permissibility of abortion as successful, we shouldn't morally risk murdering somebody, and so we shouldn't have or support our partner in having an abortion. As someone who's fairly extremist and thinks Marianne Warren's argument for the permissibility of abortion and by extension infanticide succeeds, Dan Muller's argument against having an abortion is one argument that gives me serious pause. I don't think Dan Marquis's argument against abortion is correct, but I certainly recognize it, recognize that I might be wrong. I am only fairly certain Marquis's argument fails. But according to Dan Muller's argument, my less than full certainty that Marquis's argument fails is enough to give me reason to avoid the moral risk that abortion poses and to, to behave as if abortion is wrong, since it very well might be, and it's not worth the moral risk. The notion of moral risk, or normative uncertainty, as it's called by philosophers, is, an, is only very recently being looked at by philosophers, so Moeller's argument against abortion is extremely cutting edge and untested by the gauntlet of philosophical criticism. However, I think it is a very interesting argument to consider, and I am myself uncertain how to respond to it. Perhaps you have ideas about objections that should be raised toward Dan Muller's moral risk argument? But I'm going to leave it at that. So at this point, we're just going to review what we've talked about in our summary. And the summary is just going to be going down this table of contents. So first, we talked about the notion of personhood and John Paul II's argument that it's always wrong to kill a human being and how John Paul's argument involves equivocation between a biological sense of human and a moral personhood sense of human. Then we talked about what personhood is and Marianne Warren's account of how it involves presumably these higher order cognitive abilities, but which troublingly only show up around age two, which then seems to commit us to the permissibility of infanticide if we think that it's okay to kill non-persons. Uh, then we looked at potentiality arguments and why they fail. And then more interestingly, Dan Marquis's arguments against abortion where he says, sure, maybe we're not people until age two, but before that, we existed pre prior to being persons. And what's wrong about killing us then is that we're denying us the future lives, the future goods of a life as a person. Now, then we moved on to talking about personal identity because it's noteworthy that Dan Marquis's argument depends on the claim that we existed before we were persons, that we don't come into existence at age two, that we came into existence sometime before, perhaps at conception, perhaps when we developed consciousness around week 24. Um, we have to say that we existed before we were persons, and so then we can say that we were there to be deprived of our future as persons. If you think that we didn't exist until we were persons, then Dan Marquis's argument fails. Then we look to J.J. Thompson's argument, where she says, let's forget about these debates over personhood. Let's just grant that the fetus is a person. She doesn't believe that, but she says, let's grant it for the sake of argument. Even if it's a person, she thinks in cases of 
re when re reliable contraception was used, but it happened to fail, those are cases where abortion is still permissible because of the analogy with her violinist case. And then finally, we looked at Dan Muller's argument, where Dan Muller argues, man, these issues are complicated. Like, even if you think the argument for pro-choice, that the argument that mor abortion is morally permissible succeeds, and the arguments against abortion fail, maybe even fail fairly miserably, you still can't be absolutely certain. These are really complicated things. So it's not worth taking the risk that abortion is murder. You should just avoid it even if it comes at great cost to yourself. I'll, I'm just going to add it at the end uh, a little personal note, right? So um, I'm here on the left, and my buddy Jed is in the middle, and my other buddy Mark is on the, on the right, and we all went to high school together, and then we all joined the Army, and we all fought in the various wars that we've been involved in in the united states recently um and and jed was for a while fairly broken up about his wartime service and and, and suicidal and and uh, he had a girlfriend and they broke up and then he tried committing suicide and he ended up in the hospital and then she left him and you know he didn't have a job he couldn't hold a job at the time the army wasn't taking care of him you'd be happy to learn that now he has 100 percent disability and the army takes good care of him, but at the time he had no income. She had barely any, and you know their relationship was not healthy, obviously. And uh, in the middle of all this, and I think at the time they were like about to be evicted too, at the middle of this, uh, she gets knocked up. Turns out the last time they had sex, he got her pregnant. <clears throat> and when I talked to them about it, the idea of having an abortion was just completely off the table. It was just like, no, that's wrong, that's wrong can't have an abortion it's just wrong right it was not even a consideration and i think that that you know that's a perfectly legitimate position to hold i would you know i'd be happy if people watched this lecture and concluded from the things i said that abortion's wrong or concluded that abortion's permissible but what troubled me so much about this case was the unthinking response to their situation their very complicated situation bringing a ch child into that that relationship and that life where they couldn't care for it, the mental stability of my friend Jed, I was I, I was worried about him, about the relationship, about the child, and the just complete, unthinking, immediate conviction that abortion was wrong without any consideration of the arguments on both sides really troubled me. So I tell this story in the hope that what you take away from this lecture is not that I've convinced you of one side or the other, but that when you have to deal with these issues, because almost all of you will, either you'll have to decide whether to have an abortion, you'll have to decide about whether your partner will have an abortion, you'll have to advise your sister or your friend about whether to have an abortion, and of course all of us have to make votes about public policy about abortion. I hope that you do it with some sort of informed basis on thinking through these issues, on what's morally right and what's morally wrong. Um, and that's all I hope that you might take away from this. Great. Have a good night.